Zwerf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Welcome to this Zwerf Buffy Bocconi High Level Policy Panel on Expanding Clearing in the U.S. Treasury Market, Future Proofing the World's Safe Asset. Let me start up front by thanking my ECB SSM colleague and Zwerf fellow, Martin Scheicher, who had the idea for this event and selected a fabulous group of speakers. Without further ado, over to you, Martin. Good afternoon also from my side. Uh, the starting point for this uh, panel discussion today is the fact that from the uh, structure and mechanisms, bond trading is actually inherently vulnerable. So it's quite a fragile market because it relies on dealers rather than exchanges. So these dealers provide sort of a bottleneck for to ensure market functioning. And if there are issues with participation of dealers or if costs are too high, as we are going to discuss in the next one and a half hours, they may withdraw from these markets. And actually in the last few years, we have seen a couple of um, quite major stress events two events in the in the US and one also closer to us here in Europe in the UK in the guilt crisis 22. If we could go to the next slide, please. So the purpose of my uh, presentation, my introductory presentation here is to provide you with a bit of background on bond trading, also on clearing and to outline the main themes for the discussion today, which will be chaired by Aino. So um, really the um, high vulnerability of bond trading is quite evident. If we can go to the next slide. When we compare how bond trading and, and the equity market really works. So first of all, and this is really one of the, the main issues, partly due to fiscal policy, but also due to, of course, uh, the necessary expansion to uh, fund climate risk management um, and other important tasks. The supply in government bonds in, let's say, the US and the EU is rising quite strongly, whereas actually the equity market uh, supply has been declining, at least in the last quarter. Transaction patterns are quite different in these two markets. So what we see is in the government bond market, typically few trades of large size. So this means that liquidity is sort of lumpy and depends really on trades uh, on a smaller number of trades. Whereas in the equity market, we really we typically observe many trades of small size, which of course helps with the management of liquidity. Intermediation in the bond market is quite complex because we have two separate segments, one where dealers trade among themselves and one where dealers trade with clients. Whereas in the equity market, it, the, the market structure, market microstructure is much simpler. There is only one segment and everybody can trade with everybody, typically via electronic platforms. Related to this, the trading algorithms in these two markets are also quite different in the government bond market. As I said, dealers are the bottleneck. So typically they have to promote to, to provide customers with, with quotes, whereas in the equity market, the investor can just uh, post a limit order. High frequency trading, which can also contribute to liquidity is largely absent in government bond markets overall with one notable exception. And this is something which uh, Daryl and um, Andreas are going to talk about in more detail. And this is the US Treasury benchmark bond uh, market, which is also called on the run. Whereas equity market, as we know from uh, extensive discussions, actually has quite a lot of high frequency trading. The last element to describe the fragility of liquidity in these two very different market structures is clearing. In the government bond market, clearing is quite often bilateral. And this also means that, again, the dealers need to provide balance sheet space. And if it's too expensive for them, they simply won't do it because they are profit oriented entities, whereas the equity market uses central counterparties. So all of this together means that the fragility of market liquidity is much higher in the government bond market than in the equity market. 
Um, if we can go to the next slide looking a bit at what actually these dealers do and who they are. So dealers, in particular in the EU and to some degree in the US, are typically part of major banks. So really the trading desks of GC banks and what they do is making markets rather than taking outright positions. So are simply intermedi intermediating trends. Dealers have two particular segments where they need to be constantly active. The first one is with the clients, where basically uh, they um, offer liquidity to non-banks such as asset managers or hedge funds. And after uh, observing these trading flows from the clients, the dealers need to rebalance these exposures in particular, one key goal from their business model is to achieve low inventory because the higher the inventory they keep, the higher the costs in terms of funding and also capital requirements. And both uh, capital requirements and also liquidity requirements have gone up quite a lot since the global financial crisis. This, of course, is uh, a very beneficial step because it has made the banking sector much more resilient. But there are certain variables on which, let's say, there is quite a lot of discussion on whether uh, they really are at the level which not only ensures banking sector stability, but also provides enough space for market intermediation. This is in particular the leverage ratio. Then a couple of other factors which have increased the pressure on these dealer banks. This has been the low rate environment. The a pro huge progress on electronic trading, which also means that sort of the, the rents which dealers have earned in the past have gone down and new competitors entering. And these are the trading firms and Andreas will talk about them uh, in, the, in his presentation. So let's go to the next slide. So I've tried to outline briefly the problem. So here is an overview of what we can do in terms of policy options, as mentioned, this leverage ratio, which is a non-risk weighted concept. So it doesn't really distinguish between um, junk, junk bonds or government bonds, means that the balance sheet burden of, for instance, repo business might be quite high. So the question of the, the, the appropriate calibration of the leverage ratio is one policy option. Then market structure, sort of transforming the market structure of the bond market to what we see in the equity market. All-to-all -all trading is one um, particular policy option. And, and Daryl is going to talk in detail about this also because he has been leading US efforts to reform the trading structure. Market infrastructure, I've mentioned this bilateral clearing, which imposes balance sheet costs. So why don't we move to central clearing? This is also one of the themes and Klaus is going to talk about this. And also Andreas has some thoughts on this. Another a policy option is transparency. This would not have a direct effect, but it might help in sort of increasing participation and reducing adverse effects in particular for non-banks if they get to see more data and have a better idea where the market is trading. And the last step, of course, is, as I've mentioned, in the context of the US and the UK, government bond dislocations is the role of central banks. Um, there, are, there are quite active discussions in the international sphere. So, for instance, the Bank of England has put forward something which they call a grand bargain, and there is a general discussion on what central banks could potentially do under a market maker of last resort. And here, Imen has uh, some thoughts on this. If we can go to the next slide, just to digress very quickly on CCPs, because CCPs are sort of unique creatures in the zoo of financial entities. They are private sector firms. They have uh, um, flat books, so basically they do not take outright market positions, but they are playing, a, as the name already says, a central role. And not only in repo and bond markets, but in particular, there is an obligation nowadays to, clear, to centrally clear the largest derivatives contract overall, and this is uh, swaps, in particular interest rate swaps. So CCPs are very closely linked with banks because banks bring 
the bulk of their business. Typically, non-banks are not really active as clearing members, but banks also provide not only the business, but also uh, contribute largely to the resilience of CCPs. So the link between banks and CCPs is very close and the colleagues at the BIS have used the term nexus for this very close link. So um, with CCPs, of course, increasing their role also means that there might be certain additional systemic risks. So with this, I would go to the last slide and really try to outline the main themes. So systemic risk and how the increasing liquidity pressures, uh, dash for cash episodes really have transformed. Systemic risk is one of the, of the main themes. The second one is really dealers as bottlenecks. Um, the question of how much can they contribute in terms of market liquidity and which policy action if dealers do not really provide sufficient market liquidity, in particular in high volatility times, what can central banks and supervisors do? And in this context, of course, it's not only about policy action, but also about potential side effects of policy action. So, as I said, if we give more business to central clearing, to CCPs, CCPs become even more important in the financial network. So the question is, how can we ensure their soundness? And the last dimension of policy themes here is, of course, the underlying financial markets are quite different in the US and the EU. So to discuss a little bit the differences and also the similarities. And with this, I would hand over to Aino to start the panel discussion. Thank you so much for that excellent introduction of this problem and how we can move systemic risk through the system. Fortunately, we have four excellent colleagues here with us for this afternoon panel that's going to guide us through different uh, aspects of this. First, uh, for the, those who doesn't know him, Daryl, he's a highly distinguished financial economist who is the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management and Professor of Finance at the Graduate School of Business as well as Professor by Courtesy at the Department of Economics at Stanford University. He has more than 100 research publications on a very wide range of topics in finance and has written many of the groundbreaking page, papers that we see in asset prices and the analysis of trading. And many of his papers has provided cornerstones for the key areas that we see in financial economics. And he has also been the president of the American Finance Association. Iman? is also joining us and is currently Director General Market Operations at the ECB. She started her career at the Banque de France, where she was also Director of Market Operations and Head of Financial Stability and Markets Research Division. Imen also worked at the Secretariat at the Financial Stability Board in Basel. She holds a master's degree in economics from Ecole Centrale Paris and a master's degree in economics and finance from Sciences Po in Paris. Klaus is currently the chair of the CCP Supervisory Committee at the European Securities Market Authority, ESMA, in Paris. And his responsibility encompasses the supervision of central counterparties as well as EU regulated and global regulatory activities. And prior to this, he was head of the oversight division at the ECB in charge of the oversight of financial market infrastructures, payment instruments and schemes. And he has also been the head of the secretariat of the committee on payments and market infrastructures, the CPMI, which is the global standing setting body, standard setting body in payments, clearing and settlement. He's also worked at the European Commission, Deutsche Bundesbank and in private practice. And finally, Andreas is head of financial markets in the monetary and economic department at the BIS. He has an extensive track record in policy relevant research on the role of intermediates, exchange rates, and this intersection of monetary policy and financial stability. And prior to his current position, he served for several years as secretary to the markets committee. Andreas' work is published in leading economic journals, including the Journal of Finance, and Journal of Financial Economics, and Review of Financial Studies. And he's also a CPR research affiliate. So an excellent panel for us today to go in through these topics. And I, I will need the help from you to actually keep us within the time schedule. So uh, approximately 10 minutes each, 10 to 12 minutes each, and I'll 
start the panel with you, Daryl, as just was shown by Martin, there were some major dislocations in the US Treasury markets. And we would love to hear you some of the causes and some of the ongoing reforms. And, and as Martin said, you've also been closely involved in the US reform process to, to hear what you think that this unique episode could teach us for the future. And what would be your views of an ideal market structure for the US Treasury market? So please, I can see that you already have your slides up. So please, the word over to you, Daryl. I know, thank you so much. And uh, thanks also to Martin uh, for organizing. And I'm looking forward so much to learning uh, from my colleagues on this panel. Uh, I suspect you're gonna find that uh, the evidence and the policy implications are going to be quite similar to those uh, discussed for Europe. <clears throat> but I'm going to focus on the case of the United States Treasury market, and I'm going to be relying in part on some new empirical work with colleagues at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, although they are not implicated in my views, and also on some work I did at the uh, for the Jackson Hole Symposium last summer. So first, a quick review, the, of, as everyone knows, the uh, government securities markets, ex with minor exceptions, are intermediated by large dealers. Uh, and in this schematic diagram, the green dots represent the dealers, and the blue dots represent their customer investors. Uh, they Investors can either bilaterally trade with dealers uh, by direct <clears throat> bilateral contact, or they can launch requests for quote on multilateral trade platforms. But either way, uh, their trades must pass on to the balance sheets of the largest dealers. The dealers themselves can trade on a central limit order book for certain securities, the latest hot run or on the run issues. Uh, but the customers of the dealers don't get access to those markets, which is something that Martin mentioned. Just to quickly review what happened in March 2020, this is a chart from a uh, presentation by Lori Logan, who headed the system open market account for the New York Fed at the time. She's now the president of the Dallas Fed. Indexed to 100 at the beginning of the year is the bid offer spread in the dealer to customer market. So bid offer spreads were very steady until uh, COVID was declared a pandemic on March 12th. And then as you can see, bid offer spreads uh, soared by a factor of more than 10 at the worst, and then came back down as the eventually as the market improved. In the interdealer market that I mentioned, where dealers trade with each other on the interdealer limit order book market, you can see that market depth, for example, in New York, was typically typically between 150 and 200 million before the crisis, the COVID crisis. That means that an investor, uh, a dealer in this case, that wished to uh, sell as much as possible within three ticks of the midpoint of the limit order book could sell up to $200 million. So it's a very deep market on normal days. However, by March 12th, the day the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic, that depth had virtually disappeared to around $10 million. And that was similar in London and Tokyo hours. So what is the main diagnosis for this problem? It's a limited capacity for the market. On the vertical axis of this uh, chart is the ratio of US Treasury securities outstanding to the total size of dealer balance sheets. So 0.4, where it begins around 1998, is the quantity of treasuries per dollar of balance sheet space available to the dealers in total. By the eve of the financial crisis, that situation had improved from the viewpoint of market capacity where there was not even half as much treasuries per unit of dealer balance sheet. And that was because of very light regulation and mild growth in the amount of treasuries outstanding. However, after the financial crisis, uh, regulators got quite serious about uh, financial stability and they required that dealers uh, have much higher capital requirements, and they also reduce the too big to fail effect quite a lot in terms of dealer funding costs. So by the uh, end of 2022, that ratio had climbed to uh, three and a half times its pre-crisis level, 
that is three and a half times treasure amount of treasuries per unit of dealer balance sheet. And it continues to grow rapidly as the US government uh, increases its deficits enormously. And as dealer balance sheets continue to grow at an extremely slow pace under uh, uh, more uh, under tougher uh, capital regulations. So what did the Fed do to mitigate this problem? In the middle of March, it started to buy treasury securities from dealers to relieve their balance sheets of this overload of treasury securities that they were collecting from their customers in the COVID crisis. So in the first three weeks alone, the Fed bought nearly a trillion of US treasuries from the dealers, clearing up some space so that they could buy more from their customers who were selling uh, treasuries at about double the normal pace because of the COVID crisis. Eventually, these purchases tailed off, but it took about four weeks before markets returned to normal. So one policy conclusion we should not draw is that a central bank can always fix this problem right away. It can fix the problem eventually, but not right away. Uh, this chart shows on the horizontal axis the volatility of yields in the U.S. Treasury market, on average implied by swaptions. And on the vertical axis is the first principal component of illiquidity in the U.S. Treasury market. So based on a battery of 18 different metrics, we in this research estimated the first principal component and we plotted it daily on the vertical axis. So four on this scale is four standard deviations above normal because we're plotting the z-scores. Now you can see a very regular relationship on most days. In fact, the r-squared is about 80% and it's virtually linear even if you allow for a quadratic term. But you can also see some red squares well above the curve. Those are corresponding to March of 2020 when somehow this relationship broke down. And how did it break down? What caused this normal uh, expected relationship between volatility and illiquidity to break down? It was the limited capacity of dealer balance sheets. And let me explain that. Here, by the way, is a similar chart uh, that I received from Benoit Yuen uh, from a study that was done at the ECB on the European government securities market. And you can see uh, for March of 2020, a similar breakdown in the normal relationship between volatility on the horizontal axis and illiquidity on the vertical axis. So this was not a situation unique to the US. The markets were simply unable to deal with the flood of demands for liquidity in March of 2020. I'm gonna skip this slide in the interest of time. It's from a Jackson Hole uh, calculation I did of what happens when dealers get maxed out on their available inventory, their bid offer spreads uh, widen, their prices offered decline, and volumes of trade decline dramatically unless the central bank steps in with purchases. Uh, the blue shaded region is the improvement that you get uh, when the central bank steps in with purchases. But again, I won't have time to go through this in detail. So what is the diagnosis? On the horizontal axis of this chart, is the degree to which the balance sheets of the largest dealers, the primary dealers in the United States, are being used up by demands for liquidity from their customers. And there are various metrics involved, how much risk-based uh, positions are on the balance sheets and what kinds of flows that dealers are taking from their customers. On the vertical axis is the same illiquidity measure that I described earlier, after removing the effect of volatility. So this is the residual liquidity on the vertical axis that remains once you account for volatility in the market. And you can see that on the horizontal axis, uh, when dealers are using up to, let's say, 40% of their available balance sheet capacity on average in the market, changing the degree of loading of those dealer balance sheets doesn't have very much effect on illiquidity. It stays close to the level predicted by volatility. But when balance sheets get more heavily loaded to the right of 40%, let's say 60, 70%, you can see that illiquidity is growing dramatically in a quadratic sort of relationship. 
as uh, balance sheets load, the liquidity gets to about three standard deviations or more above the level predicted by volatility. So basically uh, a near smoking gun that dealer balance sheets are not big enough or flexible enough to handle the volumes of trade. One uh, possible way to address this is to use those balance sheets more efficiently with central clearing. This chart prepared by Michael Fleming and Frank Keene at the New York Fed shows that on peak days in the actual market, the blue curve, dealers had to settle each day on the order of $1 trillion of treasuries trades. In a counterfactual world in which their trades were all centrally cleared, the commitments of their balance sheets to settlement drop about 70%. Central clearing is extremely efficient in terms of reducing dealer commitments and freeing up dealer balance sheet space. And that's above and beyond its safety and soundness implications. Finally, let me finish with some ideas for policies, some of which uh, are reminiscent of Martin's summary. So first, broad central clearing, that's actually begun in the United States in terms of rules, and it will come into force within two years. It's not perfect because there are lots of exemptions, but it's a big step forward. Second, central banks can offer their own balance sheets for financing positions that investors might not need to sell. And the, in the Fed, uh, in the case of the Fed, there are two new facilities, the standing repo facility and the foreign institutions facility that uh, offer financing to those investors that don't need to sell. Number three, we can improve the market structure by allowing in addition to dealer intermediated trade, more trade on all to all venues. This is a virtually non-existent in US markets, all to all trade in the US government securities market basically doesn't exist. Um, I'm not gonna argue, however, that this should be a rule of, by regulators, rather regulators should provide conditions for markets to develop their own uh, all to all trade uh, decisions. Number four, something else that Martin mentioned, post-trade price transparency, which will improve the efficiency of dealer customer matching because you'll search for the most efficient dealer for your trade, which is the one that has the most balance sheet space available for your trade, that will improve market efficiency. Number five, shockingly, uh, the treasury securities market is exempt from fair access provisions under US regulations. And the SEC is proposing to remove those exemptions from tre for treasuries. That's an interesting story how those exemptions ever existed in the first place. Number six, the leverage ratio rule requirement, as Martin mentioned, penalizes safe securities. It penalizes even central bank deposits, which are obviously risk-free and do not need a capital requirement. But uh, central bank deposits are used heavily in the repurchase agreement market for US government securities to provide financing and treasury securities are not as risky as many other types of risky assets like real estate loans and shouldn't be penalized with the same capital requirement. Number seven, the US government has proposed and will begin uh, this in the next month to buy back old illiquid treasury securities and replace them with new liquid on the run securities, which will improve the average stock of of securities from the viewpoint of liquidity. Uh, this is not necessarily a crisis purchase function, uh, but it will improve the average liquidity of the, of the market. The main problem in the market was illiquidity in the off the run or old securities market. <clears throat> so that's my, my go-to list for policies. I'm finished and I'm handing it back, uh, Ina. Thank you very much. And we cannot hear you. All right. Thank you so much, Daryl. And we're going to come back to discussion shortly on, on these issues. But uh, you show the picture also on the European government bond market. So that sort of gives me a cue to have hand over to you, Iman. 
Uh, here, uh, the ECB has played a major role in this market for some time now, and it would be interesting to hear you both on the trading conditions and also this March uh, 2020 incident. But if you could also provide us on, on sort of a euro system view on the bond marketing functioning in views of market functioning purchases also from the central bank. As we could see from the US, it was actually not po possible to remove this problem with just saying that you would buy something you had to actually buy bonds to get the market to calm down. But please, Imen, uh, can we have your presentation? Thank you. Thank you very much, I know, and uh, uh, good afternoon to everybody. So I, it's always difficult to speak after after Daryl because he shows all the foundational, uh, you know, concepts there. But at the same time, since he, he has shown that already, I can uh, basically follow up with an illustration of this and, and how they play out um, in the in the euro area. Yeah. So let me get uh, here. A couple of uh, slides to share um, and uh, I'll actually uh, just check that you see them in full screen. Yes, we do. Okay, very good. Excellent. So, uh, what I'm going to do today is, is basically um, show you um, how uh, the, the different uh, uh, elements that uh, Daryl outlined uh, underpin uh, the resilience of, of financial markets. And uh, I'll show a little bit the recent developments of market functioning in the euro area, uh, especially in reaction uh, to the uh, interest rate hike cycle and also to the scaling down of the central bank balance sheet. Then I will uh, touch upon some trends uh, we observe today on um, euro area repo markets as regards central clearing and non-banks that hopefully can pop uh, some discussion as well. And finally, I will indeed um, say a few words about how central banks tackle market dysfunction and we can deepen that in the discussion. So. First, uh, let's take stock of uh, the current state of uh, bond market functioning uh, in Europe. And one possible starting point uh, is to place recent developments uh, in historical perspective. And I do that on the uh, left hand side. Uh, and you see that in the past, uh, episodes of stress in government bond markets have posed challenges uh, to the transmission of monetary policy yeah, and even threatened for the sovereign crisis, the integrity of monetary union. So here uh, you can see uh, two such historical episodes, the sovereign uh, debt crisis uh, between 2010 and 2012 and the COVID-19 crisis in March 2020. And you can see that for both of these uh, crises, bond market volatility, which is uh, here in yellow, and bond market fragmentation uh, across uh, countries in the euro area, which is shown here in blue, reached very high uh, levels. And actually look at the scales, uh, which are in fact very different uh, to the scale uh, that you have on the right, which is what happened uh, more recently. And so, more recently, uh, in the period of normalization uh, of um, uh, the ECB uh, monetary policy, despite the hiking cycle being the fastest in the ECB's history, and despite this hiking cycle being accompanied by also the normalization of the balance sheet and, uh, 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 and the stop of asset purchases, we see that these two indicators of market functioning have reacted in a very muted way. There was some increase in uh, fragmentation and volatility uh, in, in these past uh, two years, but the functioning of the bond market remained considerably smoother and more robust compared to previous crises. Just to give the orders of magnitude, during the sovereign debt crisis, for instance, volatility peaked at a level 14 times higher than 2022, and fragmentation peaked at twice the level of 2022. So why is it that we didn't have a bond uh, tantrum this time? Yeah, uh, I mean, for sure, I think the market structure uh, held better than expected. I mean, we've seen a, a surprisingly strong and diversified uh, investor base uh, in euro area bond markets. 
uh, that return to fixed income markets after the period of, of negative yields. And I think that in the euro area, we also saw uh, so far, uh, and I, I wouldn't say, uh, I don't want to sound complacent, but so far sufficient uh, dealer capacity to intermediate and engineer the shift from central bank uh, market presence into private sector hands. But also an important element that contributed to protect the resilience of market functioning was actually a central bank announcement and the announcement by the ECB uh, in a preemptive manner of the transmission protection instrument, the GPI, in July 22, which is a permanent backstop tool which can be activated to counter unwarranted disorderly market dynamics that pose a serious threat to the transmission of monetary policy. And so this tool, in order to be effective, actually doesn't need to be used with volumes, uh, but already uh, in a, a preemptive manner uh, works uh, to uh, coordinate markets into a good uh, equilibrium. Let me now complement the picture uh, that I showed uh, with an evaluation of liquidity uh, conditions uh, uh, that uh, compares uh, what's happening to uh, uh, liquidity in the euro area and in um, the US. Yeah. Uh, so here on the right hand side, uh, oh, sorry, on the left hand side, uh, we show a liquidity metric based on uh, spline spreads. So the differences from uh, between the actual yield curve and the fitted yield curve for uh, German and Italian bonds vis-a-vis uh, -vis US treasuries. And higher values of these correspond to lower levels of bond market uh, liquidity. So when it goes up, it's bad. <laughs> there are two key insights uh, from this chart that I'd like to emphasize. Uh, first, there are similarities clearly uh, between the euro area and the US here in the sense that there was a tangible deterioration of bond market liquidity in uh, 2022 across uh, the board. Uh, and this deterioration happened in the context of central bank interest rate hikes. But second, as a point of difference, uh, this uh, chart suggests that deterioration, uh, the deterioration in uh, uh, euro area markets, so uh, the, the yellow and um, blue line actually uh, reversed in 2023, whereas liquidity conditions in the US by this indicator uh, have not come back to normal yet and remain less favorable. Different conjunctural factors may help explain uh, this somewhat counterintuitive um, evidence and, and, for instance, uh, the persistence of high uncertainty about uh, US uh, inflation and, and growth uh, could have impacted uh, the liquidity of US treasuries. But thinking of market structure and going back to Daryl's uh, uh, insights that he just shared with us, Part of the story may also relate to trends and in intermediation capacity of, of dealers. And so in the chart here on the right hand side, we replicated um, your indicator, uh, Daryl, um, of uh, utilization of primary dealer uh, capacity uh, for the US. So this is exactly what you showed us previously in yellow, and you see it increasing all the time. And we've done it also for Euro area banks um, here in blue. And uh, what we see is that uh, uh, in the Euro area, in contrast to the US, uh, the uh, capacity, as far as we can measure it with this indicator, uh, indicates only a modest rise in the constraints on dealer intermediation capacity uh, since uh, we started to reduce the balance sheet. So if you look at um, the last bars on the, on the right, and they remained uh, very, very contained uh, in relative to historical standards. So it seems like, you know, one, uh, <laughs> we are lucky in this phase uh, that we are, um, the, the DCP is withdrawing from bond markets in a context where in the euro area, uh, dealer balance sheet capacity is not so stretched uh, by historical standards. Then 
I wanted to come to, sorry, a point regarding um, euro area repo markets and central clearing uh, in, in this market. Um, so here I use data from a new database that we are exploiting uh, called the Securities Financing Transaction Data Store, SFTDS, uh, that shows uh, on a transaction by transaction basis, and here we show aggregates, uh, the evolution of bank and non-bank access to repo markets. And we look at this access to repo markets in cleared format, so through CCPs, and in bilateral format without CCPs, therefore using dealer balance sheet capacity. And uh, it's the, the repo market is of course a backbone of uh, the government bond market because this is where you would go for financing uh, securities and also for placing your cash in collateralized format. And so here we show the evidence about volumes of repo transactions uh, using government bond collateral from Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. And what you observe is that uh, uh, if you look at uh, the um, dotted line, the black dotted line, which represents the total volumes in uh, the repo market, uh, there is uh, an increase or throughout the period and these volumes remain quite robust, uh, about 500 billion uh, of weekly volumes in 2023 and 2024. But what is striking is that uh, uh, the volume, sorry, uh, the volume of uh, transactions between uh, between banks uh, and non-banks uh, in a non-centrally cleared uh, format, and that's the green area, non-CCP, non-bank, has been growing much faster than for transactions uh, conducted with non-banks through CCPs, which is the yellow um, area. And so today uh, we estimate by this data that non-centrally cleared transactions with non-banks uh, represent uh, around 30% of the total volume of repo transactions in the euro area. And so this uh, evidence prompts an important question about the accessibility of uh, central clearing for buy-side um, actors. Uh, of course, and I'm sure that Klaus will say more about that, I mean, the high cost of membership, uh, the lengthy setup process may lead these actors uh, to rely heavily on bilateral repo uh, transactions. But of course, this reliance potentially introduced higher levels of uh, counterparty credit risk uh, into, uh, into the repo market. And I think also weighs into um, dealer balance sheet capacity uh, in this market. Uh, and as an aside, I mean, uh, as, uh, among the type of non-banks that may be transacting in a bilateral uh, manner, uh, is hedge funds, yeah? And we have seen in the euro area, but I think it's the same in the US, uh, a growing participation of hedge funds uh, in the uh, volume of repo on government bond markets and also uh, in the volumes on the cash bond market, basically using a variety of strategies, relative value strategies uh, for the US basis trade strategies, uh, auction cycle and all of this. And uh, I think there is a, a reason to, um, if these are non-centrally cleared uh, transactions, uh, a reason to wonder about uh, what kind of systemic risk this may be introducing into the system. And then uh, to finish, I said that I, uh, I will say a few words about uh, uh, central bank uh, role in addressing uh, market dysfunction. Uh, but here I'll just give you a teaser and uh, I'll be uh, very happy to take questions. Uh, so when should central banks intervene to address uh, market dysfunction? And in the euro area, we have a dual view on this. Uh, we see two types of, of market dysfunction as dangerous for the smooth transaction of monetary policy and, and the um, uh, obstacles to transmission would always be the foundation uh, for our intervention. The first one uh, can, in principle, be faced by all central banks. Uh, transmission can be threatened by excess volatility and poor liquidity in core markets. 
But the second type of market dysfunction is more specific to the euro area uh, and to the situation in a currency uh, union where uh, transmission can be undermined by uh, financial fragmentation across jurisdictions and in extreme uh, scenarios, uh, self-fulfilling expectations, uh, questioning the integrity of monetary union. And so historically, the ECB has tackled uh, market dysfunction uh, with a very wide range of market stabilization measures. So for instance, during the pandemics, we used uh, large scale asset purchases like the Fed, uh, uh, for our case, uh, under the pandemic emergency purchase program, the PEP, and we couple that also with sizable uh, targeted lending operations, uh, the TLTROs, as well as uh, swap lines and, and repo lines. Yeah. Uh, but, as I said, we also have this example of a backstop instrument, uh, the TPI, that was introduced after the pandemic. And uh, despite the fact that it was never used uh, in practice, has been quite effective in addressing uh, potential uh, market dysfunction. And finally, I think it's fair to say that uh, while uh, central banks in general have done a lot to stabilize financial markets over the past uh, 15 years, there are really limits uh, to what they can and what they cannot do. Uh, I think central banks cannot uh, end up being uh, the only uh, game in town when there, when there is market dysfunction. And this is why I really welcome uh, the efforts uh, that are being done in the US and elsewhere, uh, both by market participants and by authorities to strengthen market structure and market functioning uh, in a preemptive manner. And let me stop there and leave uh, the rest for discussion. Thank you so much, Iman. Both uh, similarities and differences between the markets here, and, and very interesting to hear about the non-bank, non-CCP cleared part of the uh, the repo market. But coming to the issue of, of clearing, then uh, Klaus, since you're sharing the. CCP supervisory committee. I mean, one of the proposals here is to have more central clearing in these markets. And uh, in against this background, what do you see as the situation for clearing of fixed interest income instruments in the in the EU? And uh, what do you see that the supervisory and regulatory response needs to be if we get even more systemically important uh, CCPs going forward? It's a pleasure for me to join this panel and uh, add a bit of color on the clearing landscape. Uh, actually, a lot has already been said by my uh, previous co-panelists, but uh, perhaps one short introductory point. I will not provide explanations on the supervisory committee at ESMA, but just to stress uh, that it has a rather interesting mandate because it not only looks at enhancing the supervisory convergence of EU CCP supervision. It also directly supervises uh, the systemically important UK CCPs from an EU market perspective, and it also recognizes and monitors other third country CCPs that have a linkage to the EU financial markets. So we have a rather wide perspective and a right view, also comparing developments in different parts of the globe, which is quite interesting in this. But Overall, and it has been mentioned already, indeed, there are quite a number of developments uh, in the uh, clearing space, and uh, the CCP landscape is a highly dynamic one. This holds true both for market developments, uh, where the range of assets and asset classes uh, that are subject to clearing uh, is increasing, ranging from bonds, equities, uh, derivatives, in particular, we had the mentions of interest rate derivatives, repos, and more recently to crypto derivatives in a wide spectrum of different forms and shapes. Uh, but another major driver, uh, and perhaps you can go to the next slide, is uh, also the regulatory uh, background. And uh, this comes uh, back to the origins of the great financial crisis where actually the concept of mandatory clearing originates uh, in the current form. And uh, we have been uh, looking at a number of developments since global standards have evolved, national regulation has evolved on the side of the EU. We have gone to various iterations of the basic uh, underpinning of the uh, CCP regulation, which is EMEA, uh, leading up currently to what is labeled EMEA 3.0, uh, 
uh, which is actually aiming to strengthening a number of aspects, but more specifically and probably of interest also to today's discussion, it is also looking at a transversal view because of the interdependencies across CCPs, across clearing members, and also across clients, that is non-banks. A dimension, a perspective which was currently uh, is currently not as visible as it should be, and we have seen this in some iterations of the crisis that we have been scrambling to get visibility and data on some of those aspects. Another aspect uh, which is also contemplated in EMEA 3 is uh, to look at various forms of enhancing access to clearing, again, a notion that has been mentioned by a couple of the colleagues before. I will not dive too much into the US dimension. Daryl has given a very nice overview on this, but uh, just to say that there are some differences between the US and the EU side. When I see at the main drivers of the US discussion, uh, looking at the capacity of the broker dealers, the growing role of non-bank financial institutions, but also perhaps, uh, and this was not mentioned so uh, strongly at the uh, role of principal trading firms, uh, but uh, this is something which does not mirror exactly in the EU side. And perhaps if we can move to the next slide, let me just highlight some particularities of uh, the EU uh, market and in particular the clearing side of it. If I start with the European government bond market, there is significant fragmentation. We have lower electronification rates, there's a use of more traditional execution mechanisms and a high reliance on primary dealers. And this to some degree also explains why there is a smaller share of trading by non-bank financial institutions, uh, where the NBFIs are mostly active in the futures markets, whereas their participation in cash markets is very limited. But if you look at clearing, there are as well significant differences across countries and products. Basically, all uh, cash bonds are being cleared bilaterally, uh, whereas if you look at the Italian markets, cash bonds are mainly centrally cleared, and uh, there's also some differences to the role of different players. Let me just, just stress that even within EMEA and the central clearing mandate, there are significant exemptions in particular for certain public bodies when it comes to mandated central clearing. Looking at the repo side, uh, the repo markets in Europe play an important role uh, in the interbank segment and they are uh, characterized by sizable trading on electronic platforms and central clearing. Uh, and rather low utilization of two-party transactions. You may have some differences of notions as to the role of central clearing in the repo side. Um, it ranges between 40 and 70%, whether you look at uh, daily volumes or rather at outstanding principal amounts, but clearly this is already a significant number to start with. Let me perhaps uh, again, if you compare this to the US side uh, where uh, currently, the significant portion of the treasury markets is uncleared. Uh, you see, we cannot fully compare uh, the two sides. However, there's more to be done. And indeed, uh, we are looking at increasing the role of central clearing uh, also as part of the wider notion. And uh, ESMA, like uh, the euro system, like the central banks, are very much invested in the capital markets union project, where also uh, there are aspects uh, to see where there is a further improvement, for example, of repo markets possible. But let me focus on two specific aspects uh, that may be interesting for our debate. First uh, is the recent stress events and the role of margin possibility. And here again, CCPs play a major role uh, when it comes to managing risk and in managing also potential uh, liquidity stresses that may arise uh, because of the need to put at short notice uh, high amounts of margin. We have been undergoing a wide array of different stress events over the ca past couple of years uh, with the dash for cash in 2020, with the guilt turmoil, uh, but also the stresses we have seen on the energy and gas markets, in particular on the EU side. In all those instances, uh, we have been seeing major spikes in margin demand um, and we also have seen a scrambling of some market participants mostly on the non-bank side for liquidity uh, 
But overall, the clearing side, the central clearing, the CCPs, the framework that has been established has been robust. We have seen the spikes, they could be handled. And uh, still, of course, there is no room for complacency. On the side of the supervisory committee, we are taking a very close look at whether we have identified some particular issues. Uh, we have been uh, actually undergoing a public consultation on our anti-cyclicality tools uh, just to see uh, whether there are some consequences to be drawn uh, from uh, some of the particular uh, issues we have seen before now the other CCP. Again, this is going on. And we are also contributing very strongly on the side of ESMA and the supervisory committee to the international work when it comes to increasing transparency of margin requirements. EMEA already contains quite wide ranging requirements on CCPs with margin calculators and similar tools. But of course, there's a similar need to be transparent in the relationship between querying members and clients. So again, we welcome the discussions around this, uh, both in EMEA 3 and in the international discussions. Perhaps one last point that I want to share, and then I'm looking forward to the discussion. I want to highlight that CCPs by themselves also uh, act as market players, and in particular in the European repo markets. This is to the fact that EMEA requires European CCPs to turn their unsecured cash holdings from the collection of margins into highly liquid securities. In practice, this means that a number of EU and also UK CCPs reinvest large amounts of cash in reverse repos. We can see that this can have a quite systematic downward pressure in short term rates. And we have also been noting that uh, CCPs, to the extent that they are systemic to financial markets in various ways, can potentially affect also the impact, uh, uh, the conduct of monetary policy. Uh, Imen is certainly aware of this, but I'm not going into the details, but it shows and emphasizes even more the need for a robust supervision of CCPs. Perhaps one last angle, and uh, to end on this note, uh, one recurring issue that comes up here is the discussion around the access of CCPs to central bank accounts. And uh, this is not a new discussion. Uh, here are different dimensions like granting access to CCPs, original currency and foreign currencies. Given that CCPs clear multiple currencies, there is not such an issue as a relation with the home uh, central bank. Uh, there's a distinction between CCPs who have a banking license and those who have not, and also uh, issues around granting access to liquidity facilities has been coming up. Again, EMEA 3 has been mandating ESMA to provide within the next two years a report on these kind of issues and go back to the EU uh, legislators. But of course, this is something where I look forward to interesting discussions also with my friends from the central banks. Let me stop short on this, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Klaus. That has been an issue that we've been discussing in Sweden also with access to our, our local CCP. Uh, but the question here then, of course, we come with new regulations and, and we move uh, uh, risk between different participants in the financial system. And here, uh, finally, I would like to give the word to Andreas to talk a little bit about the key, key question here, which is, which contribution can you ha then have from market liquidity to systemic risk? And, and what is your analysis of policy lessons going forward for, for this issue? So please, Andreas. Yes, thank you very much, first of all, to, uh, to the organizers and uh, um, uh, for being, from being part of this, uh, this panel. So what I will be focusing on uh, in my remarks is going to be on central clearing. So trying to complement uh, what Klaus said, but also uh, in particular what, what Iman and Daryl said. Um, and this is quite uh, really a, a significant undertaking uh, for the financial system. One might think it's a plumbing issue. But it's much, much more than that. It really is at the heart of how the system, how the financial system works. And so it's, it's really a, a very important reform effort and, and push that we're seeing now with the, with the SEC rules uh, that, that have been uh, introduced lately. So um, I thought it's useful to, to also take first a quick step back. Uh, and, and think about um, how we got here uh, in terms of uh, central clearing. 
And uh, obviously we've been to some degree here before, uh, after the GFC, with a strong push of OTC derivatives, uh, standardized products uh, uh, into central clearing. So the famous F Pittsburgh declaration that, um, that um, uh, provided the mandate for that push. Um, and so really the, the main rationale was to remove the complex of uh, complex web of opaque bilateral relationships that characterize the OTC derivatives transactions. Um, and also to uh, enhance the transparency uh, of OTC markets uh, in this way, also via the reporting requirements uh, uh, and the, uh, the platform trading requirements. So there's been a lot of progress in the interest rate derivative space uh, ever since uh, and, and other key segments of fixed income markets, um, but we're not yet fully there. So there still remains uh, some work to be done in this regard. Uh, but as has also been said, um, in key other markets, other OTC markets, the cash government bond and repo markets, um, these have been outside of these reforms and uh, um, uh, the take up is, is much more limited. Uh, certainly when it comes to clearing of government bonds, there is much more on repo as we have seen in Iman's presentation and what Klaus said. Um, however, I think what we've also learned um, uh, over the last period since the GFC is that even these super safe assets, um, bonds, repos, they can be at the epicenter of systemic uh, stress. So it's, it's very important to think about uh, these markets and, and, and how they function in a period of, of distress. So uh, on this slide, um, I've been summarizing uh, some of the key differences between bilateral clearing, central clearing. Again, a lot has been said already, um, so I try to keep this short. Um, uh, in terms of the benefits, clearly uh, with central clearing, there is the possibility of freed up intermediation space that is, is provided via the, the netting. Um, and uh, also uh, counterparty credit risk is significantly reduced um, as well as uh, transparency is, is, is strongly increased. So these are all very good benefits, but I think we also need to, um, need to be mindful that um, while some key risk exposures are being reduced, uh, the risks themselves, they change in their nature. Uh, and in particular, uh, also as Klaus has alluded to, um, liquidity risk may get more at the fore while the credit risk itself is is uh, is reduced so so the ability to manage this liquidity risk to access cash at short notice uh to pay margins uh, that that's absolutely crucial and when it comes to new risks um now with the emergence of ccps um they themselves become a single point of failure um, and so uh, we, we also have to face this concentration risk in the financial system that has also significantly increased. Now, when it comes to the US Treasury market, um, in fact, there are some uh, microstructural features that are quite unique about uh, how that market operates. Uh, and and uh, also, as has been said before, the European markets are significantly different, but arguably in the US case, really the the the, the the case is a very strong one to, to push ahead with central clearing of government bonds. And the key reason is the rise of high speed, high frequency traders, uh, the so-called PTFs. Um, and the fact that um, they're basically uh, uh, trading um, with interdealer brokers who take on quite a significant amount of principal risk in this market. And so essentially we, we're facing a situation where we have these high speed bullet trains running on quite uh, wobbly tracks. Um, and that's, that's really a, a recipe for disaster. So, so I think it's very good that the, that the ECC is now, SEC is now moving ahead and, uh, um, uh, and tries to bring that activity to, to centrally, central clearing so as to improve the operational and, and financial resilience of the system. Now, with regard to other markets, uh, um, indeed for Europe uh, or also Japan, uh, other core markets, we don't really see such a strong penetration of, of uh, PTFs. Uh, there's significantly less uh, electronification in these markets. It's there, it's mostly in the futures market, but not in the, in the cash government bond market. 
uh, and also primary dealers have a much stronger grip uh, in general. They they have been uh, uh, also showing a tendency to to centrally clear uh, to to not centrally clear, uh, with some exceptions, uh, as was mentioned, Italy, but but Japan is an, an exception as well. So maybe one could say that um, from from really this operational resilience point of view and counterparty credit point of view. The push is is maybe less urgent uh, towards central clearing because one could assume that these dealers know how to manage their uh, counterparty credit risk quite well via their bilateral margining processes. But uh, there's still maybe a point to be made that uh, um, if limited intermediation capacity is a problem, then uh, central clearing should be beneficial in these markets too. Um, and also, especially because central clearing could be really that conduit that would allow uh, all to all trading to 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 take place. So it seems like a, an important uh, condition um, under which uh, all to all trading can thrive. And so to me, this overcoming the uh, fragmentation that still exists in the government bond markets in, in Europe and how they are traded, as well as the underlying infrastructure would seem a, a very important issue to take on in the CMU context in Europe. So uh, a key question is, um, what does this all mean uh, for market liquidity and fixed income going forward? Um, there are definitely benefits in, 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 in terms of the market liquidity, uh, especially I would say in stress times. Uh, so all the uh, benefits that we've been discussing, reduced counterparty risk, improved operational resilience, that should be should be uh, very good uh, factors supporting liquidity in stress times. Similarly, the more el elastic uh, liquidity supply by, by dealers, the market structural changes. But then I think we also have to be aware that there are costs associated with this push as well. Uh, so clients will face costs to access central clearing. There would be greater funding needs in general for the for the margins uh, in the system, and so this might mean that some of these relative value trades that we know have been supporting uh, market liquidity that they might get less viable. Um, and so I guess my thesis would be that we we may have a situation where. Uh, the market liquidity is um, somewhat less liquid in normal times, um, but then, however, it's it's going to be more resilient uh, during stress times. But we'll have to see. It's very difficult to quantify at this stage. And so my final point then relates to uh, financial stability um, and that we need to uh, brace ourselves, I would say, for uh, a greater prevalence of liquidity rather than credit crisis, given these structural changes that we're we're observing, and that that also uh, we as the public sector are uh, advocating. So, in particular, this fixed income CCP that clears the government bond market will be a super systemic entity, something we will have to face. Uh, it, it's going to be crucial on its own. It will clear the risk-free assets. So it has to be um, uh, an entity that is super robust. Um, and uh, in case this entity would go down, that's, that would be really a, a doomsday scenario. And, uh, and therefore, at least in, in, in my view, we really have to think very hard about access to central bank lending facilities for that entity. Um, and going going beyond the deposits, which which typically exists uh, in, in in a few cases um, right now. Of course, there is the typical issue about um, uh, moral hazard quid uh, quid pro quo, and so uh, any of this access would have to come with quite uh, strong supervisory requirements. But um, but to me, giving that entity access under these conditions would seem uh, very important. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then I think I'll, I'll do another round with the panel here to make sure that you have an opportunity to comment on each other. And especially if there's some statement or other that you would not agree with, or perhaps have a difference of opinion. But to start this off, I would also like to, to take a question from Ernest here in the chat where he, he asks that. Many of you have pointed to the differences in the sovereign bond market structure and organization between the European uh, markets and the US. And he asks, what are the reasons for these differences? Is this plainly history? 
that we have different financial institutions with different capabilities and interests? Is it because in the EU, we don't really have a capital markets union, we have all different sovereign issues, or is it because of the dominant role that the US dollar or US treasuries play in the global financial system? Or do you have another explanation? So I'll, I'll send that question with you, but I'll start with you, Daryl. Do you have, what are your thoughts after hearing our colleagues here uh, talking about this, these issues? I'm struck by both the similarities and the differences. The most critical difference, I think, Imen illuminated very well, which is that the uh, authorities in Europe have to deal not only with the usual uh, concerns about a bond market with insufficient capacity and stress, but also the issues of fragmentation. And uh, you know, maybe when Imen or others have a chance, it would be helpful to understand. Uh, what metrics one can blink, bring to play to measure the degree of fragmentation other than simply a bond spreads, which can reflect other quality related differences. So are there, are there uh, ways to measure when, uh, let's say, an authority needs to step in and purchase based uh, specifically on uh, differences, uh, expanding differences in liquidity uh, or a kind of spiral, unnecessarily large spiraling out of control of adverse expectations about liquidity on the one hand uh, versus, uh, as I said, quality differences. Uh, that, that would be really interesting for me. Thank you. And Iman, uh, what are your comments after hearing the presentations? And on the US uh, EU differences? Yeah, no, so I agree with Daryl that we have to deal with this additional dimension of fragmentation. And indeed, I mean, uh, the, the traditional way that we look at it as, as kind of you know, standard deviation of bond yields, for example, across countries. But now more and more, indeed, we also look at uh, liquidity indicators and how they behave differently. So I think this would be uh, something we, we, we look at more and more. And also this relation between, you know, volatility and liquidity that I think we can also look at on a cross um, country perspective, not only uh, for, for the euro area as a whole. Yeah. Um, I mean, among the differences, I think it's really the, the financial uh, system structure is very different. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the euro area um, financial system is bank based. Okay, and I think this is uh, uh, one reason why, as uh, you know, Klaus mentioned, um, the the role of non bank uh, financial institutions has been historically less. But I think my sense is that, uh, to some extent, although they are uh, uh, more muted, we see some of the trends that are common. So I think that the rise of uh, non bank institutions. Uh, is now also starting to reach the shores of the of the euro area, and so this is why this conversation is interesting because I think we can learn from each other. And uh, Klaus, you're also like you said, the ESMA is also looking at the markets for the CCPs in other countries. What would you be your view then on on the differences on and the comments on the others presentation? Not end. I must agree with Daryl, we had a lot of similarities, uh, not so much to add here. And uh, the key points uh, that have been pointed out, uh, fragmentation of markets clearly is an issue. I would rather put it as an incomplete capital markets union, hoping yeah. that we have a bit of dynamics in that direction. The roles of banks, for sure, uh, and that ties back uh, also to the liquidity issue. When we have seen in the recent crisis, these strong interdependencies, a small number of very active clearing members who are participating in all CCPs and who also, in some instances, not only deal with their own margins, but also have liquidity lines for CCPs or clients, uh, which are non-banks, uh, the uh, liquidity issue becomes even more pronounced. And we have to think about the way the structure is working here. That's why the discussion around access models to central clearing becomes even more prevalent. Um, but one point perhaps on uh, Andrea's point, CCPs are systemic by nature. And uh, I hope we have done 
already a huge step with very high degree of very robust, very stringent international standards implemented, looking at the implementation, but also complementarity to the recovery and resolution frameworks that we have applied uh, that provide a bit of uh, comfort here. And I must say, at least from the EU perspective, having seen at the uh, impact on the crisis, we are certainly seeing the mitigating impact on these regulatory developments. Thank you. And uh, Andreas, last uh, words on this European US divide and, and comments to you. Yes, so uh, on the on the US European divide, I think uh, there is really a history uh, path dependence here definitely at play uh, as well. And it has to do with also immense said with with uh, some differences in terms of the, the bank based versus market based structure. But at some stage, it was allowed to to have these uh, principal trading firms operating on the inter dealer brokers. And that was a game changer, I guess, in terms of non bank access in the in the US case. Uh, so there's been some work uh, I, I, I remember by Michael Fleming and so on, who's describing that microstructural change. Um, and um, however, that wasn't so much taken place in Europe. So uh, it's a it's a it's been a market that's been much more closely uh, interlinked with the primary dealers uh, activity and the MTS market in in uh, in Italy, where where these players would not be allowed to access. And and so it, that's that's pretty much uh, remained like that uh, until now. And whereas something different hap has been happening in the futures market and some of the derivatives markets. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that that's a, a key factor that explains these differences. Then maybe just a quick reaction to uh, to Iman. Uh, she showed this very interesting uh, development now of the non-bank, uh, non-CCP repo transactions that's been going up, and that's of course super super interesting. Uh, I, I think in this regard, what could be also worth looking at is what kind of trades are these repos financing, and uh, um, maybe. Uh, it's, uh, you know, some of these players might be benefiting from the better bespoke uh, margins and, and, and more bespoke uh, netting arrangements that uh, come along with the bilateral repo. So understanding from the client side why, why this activity is, is being pushed into bilateral might be, might be very uh, interesting. And there's been a recent OFR paper uh, making that case. Uh, for the US bilateral repo market that oftentimes it's these so-called netted packages that um, that uh, enjoy very, very low uh, haircuts. And so uh, that, that's a big driver and sort of push for that activity. Yeah, let me stop here. Thank you. Do you have a comment on that last point, Iman, or? Yeah, no, that that's indeed a really uh, relevant question, and I think in particular separating how much is quote unquote, as you said, opportunistic because they would get lower haircuts bilaterally than in CCPs, and and how much is due to restriction, you know, perceived. Uh, uh, hurdles to access cleared transactions because you know non banks have to you know, go through a clearing member. This may be expensive. It requires to set up capacity and so on. So uh, I, I think that's something we will uh, we we will look at quite carefully. And of course, the systemic implication uh, is not the same uh, whether. Uh, you reply that this is uh, opportunistic or, 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 or not, yeah. But what I wanted to say was about this chart, just uh, um, going back to what uh, Klaus uh, said, is that even though I, I, I highlighted this, this growth uh, of non-bank, uh, non-CCP, because it was quite striking, you, you still see that, uh, in general, the repo market in the euro area is predominantly CCP based when you take uh, the, the, the graph and you look at the percentage of uh, interbank CCP and, and non-bank CCP as percentage of total. So I think this is overall an element uh, of resilience that we take uh, comfort in. Mm. Thank you. And I have another question in the chat here from Ernest, which relates to the, the recipe for solving these issues going forward. We had a quite a long list from, from Daryl here on proposals in the 
in the US market. And, and one question I would like to ask, and when it comes to to dealer capacity, of course, one part of this is, is using the capacity more efficiently than going through CCP clearing. The other one is prudential requirements and having more lenient prudential requirements. And uh, I might be more skeptical to the latter one, since we're still in the process of, of implementing Basel III and, and having spent the, the years since the global financial crisis uh, looking at, at risk-based requirements having their problems as well. But I would like to ask you, are there any sort of, what would be your priorities in, in these uh, sort of recipes going forward? And is this something that you think is less uh, uh, relevant for the US? We've already discussed some of that, but uh, I'll, I'll leave the word to, to you first, Daryl, which, which way is the best way forward, reducing, uh, increasing capacity or using it more efficiently or both? Well, both, of course, and uh, uh, the Basel III endgame has generated enormous controversy in the United States with even huge advertisements during the Super Bowl uh, football championship uh, about stop the endgame. Uh, this is crazy, and I've spoken uh, to industry forums saying the Basel III endgame is needed for financial stability. And even though it will harm liquidity in the short run, it will improve liquidity once the capital requirements have been raised. There's lots of theory and evidence supporting that. Uh, as far as the most important step, I think without mandating all to all trade, regulators need to set an environment in which the cheapest way to meet all of their requirements is to move to all to all trade. Uh, and I think that central clearing is an important step in that direction, but market transparency which Martin mentioned, price transparency so that customers see where the best prices are available uh, is, is crucial. Neither of those are present in the United States uh, and in Europe, I'm not sure the situation, but all conditions leading to central uh, to all to all trade uh, would be very helpful in the US context. Thank you, and Iman. Yeah, I, I think like Daryl that you need um, a, a number of, of different actions because the horizons are not the same. I mean, in order to change uh, banking regulation, you need a decade. Yeah. So even though here we are talking of adjustments to the leverage ratio and not a, an overhaul, uh, I'm not very hopeful that we will see that in the very short term. So I think we ought to pursue the other um, avenues. I definitely think that everything that can be done to put more into CCPs should be done. And uh, as I said, I think the buy side uh, may be an area where uh, this this can be the efforts can be stepped up, uh, especially uh, uh, the buy side to the extent that uh, uh, they they pose higher risks. Uh, and I have in mind, you know, this leveraged players uh, in particular. Uh, and, and then on all to all platforms, I completely agree with Daryl. I mean, we see more and more market participants who actually uh, uh, are clamoring to have the possibility to trade um, with other buy side participants. But uh, the only platform in Europe where, where I saw that happening is actually uh, on a credit platform. Yeah, so there's this market access that that uh, uh, is growing uh, very strongly. But it seems that government bond markets, the dealers are quite efficient in locking in any um, new initiatives to to go into all to all. And so I think, you know, I'm, I'm not advocating competition policy here, but <laughs> but I think that there ought to be a more um, open infrastructure to also uh, uh, allow um, and, and to some extent, the dealers, in my view, instead of hindering that uh, to preserve margin, uh, would actually uh, should, should be embracing that because I think it would free up uh, their capacity from a balance sheet perspective. But but okay, we are in this uh, in this place where uh, it's not happening yet. So indeed, let's hope that uh, the equilibrium um, moves from that regard. Mm. Thank you. And and Klaus, you were talking also before about the pro cyclicality of margins and, and uh, issues that we're trying to look into that in Europe. But please, what are your views on the most important reforms here? That is a question which will probably occupy myself for the next five years of legislative discussion. Uh, on the pro cyclicality, again, it is important uh, to recall 
that the procyclical nature of margins is part of the game. That's mm -hmm. how margins are supposed to work. They should just not be excessive. And uh, for this, uh, we have been looking at specific tools uh, to make sure that there is an assimilation across uh, CCPs on some of the key parameters uh, that come with the calculation of uh, anti-physicality tools. But uh, more widely, I think we are back to the question, and this holds true in particular for the non-banks, uh, do we have the calibration of incentives for central clearing right? It took us years after the great financial crisis to come up with something where uh, we, in the end, managed to make it work for a set of instruments, OTC derivatives, uh, that are subject to the central clearing. But the markets have moved, and I think it is time to really take a step back and look more broadly at uh, all the elements that together make this up. It's not just mandating certain uh, cattle requirements. It's not just putting in certain haircuts. It's a wider issue, and I think that is something which probably now is the right moment to engage in. Thank you. That's a very good point. Uh, Andreas. Yes, uh, thank you. So, um, yeah, I, I agree basically with, with what, uh, in particular, Man said. I mean, it, and also Daryl, you need a combination of policies. There's not really a, a silver bullet here, it seems. Uh, I, I'm also skeptical whether um, the, you know, the, the, the easing of regulatory requirements, in particular, leverage ratio in itself would be would be that helpful. It's a bit of a slippery slope uh, in some ways. Uh, and uh, I think ultimately what we what we want is um, balance sheets to be flexibly coming in when there is a, uh, a crisis mode, when there are also opportunities, when there are market opportunities. So anything we can do to allow that balance sheet to balance sheet capacity to be coming to the market, um, that, uh, that that will be very important, and that can come from from non banks as well as as. Uh, all to all was mentioned several times. So I think uh, reforms that can help us uh, um, incentivize that extra balance sheet to come in, that also from the non-bank side, I think that would be that would be very important. Um, my fear with the leverage ratio is that um, you know it would then still be maxed out to the fullest when you're when you are providing. A, uh, a relief, and so we might not get at this point where this elasticity is is, is much improved. So that would be that would be my main concern with, with that. And otherwise, I fully agree with uh, with Klaus that margin procyclicality is something we we have to work on because this is really what's causing a lot of pressure on the system, uh, gives rise to potentially destabilizing spirals and and. Um, and uh, deleveraging pressure on the system that can overhel overwhelm really that uh, dealer capacity. And so uh, definitely that would be quite high on my agenda. Okay, I think I'll manage one short question before I leave the word to Ernest to finalize this, uh, this interesting webinar, but it would be a combination of two questions from the chat. So one is, it's basically a lot of the times we, we look at the problems from the past and we try to solve them with the future regulation. But do you see anything in the future that might change uh, the situation of these markets? One question here is AI informed driven trading. Uh, and the question, other one relates to non bank financial institutions. Do you see new players taking? We've talked about their dominance, but do you see something in the future that we have to think about already? now to make sure that we don't have new stability risks. Daryl. Well, I won't speak to AI uh, because others will know more, but I don't think that's going to be the key in this particular market. It's already being used by high frequency traders, but uh, in terms of uh, what what's we see in the future, I think it's going to be, it's going to need to be more entry from non-bank financial institutions. So contrary to what some have suggested, I think uh, a greater role for NBFI is probably needed under the right uh, financial stability conditions. And one way to do that is uh, to provide, to lay the groundwork by which the market evolves toward a more all-to-all -all trade. In the 2020 crisis, uh, volatility soared in equity markets. However, the market kept functioning extremely well. 
Uh, and so we need the, and that market, the equity market is heavily dealer intermediated. Not many know that about half or nearly half of that market is dealer intermediated, but the extra flexibility of all to all trade was crucial for that market to keep operating. And that there is absolutely no reason that that could not be the case also in government securities markets. The conditions are at least as um, appropriate and happy to debate that anytime. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, maybe I, I bring a new uh, perspective here that hasn't been uh, mentioned. Uh, and, and that is, I think we also need a, a strong and diversified investor base uh, for government bond markets. So we need a good mix of uh, basically price sensitive, price insensitive investors. Uh, and and we we also uh, need a good mix of balance sheets that are elastic uh, and balance sheets you know that are potentially more uh, uh, inert or stale. So so I would say uh, this is something we 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 need to look at more. It's not easy to mandate. Yeah, it's something that comes a, a little bit as a, a, an outcome. Uh, but, but certainly, uh, that's a dimension. So, for example, when we look at, uh, uh debt management offices and, and how they look at, uh, at market functioning from their viewpoint of in issuers, they do take the investor base into account and, and, and how they want this investor base to, uh, to evolve. Uh, so I think it's part of, of the mix and, and one where, um, I think we can, uh, we can still uh, make progress. Thanks. Thank you. Klaus. Not much to add, and uh, perhaps just to say, uh, without focusing on AI, or the other issue, which I'm always happy if a panel doesn't mention it, which is T plus one, uh, but there is a combination, and we need to watch out closely by focusing too much on optimizing the current setup that there may be coming uh, from the rare mirror uh, alternative clearing models. And mm. there are some in the making, which may challenge the way uh, the infrastructure is currently set up and uh, operates. So that's just something to be aware of. I'm not saying it may help or it may not help, but we should avoid to di be distracted to not see certain developments coming. Thank you. Yes, a tokenized world also coming forward. But final words then also, Andreas. Yes, uh, my, my point would have exactly been on tokenization, which I think is probably among the technology uh, developments, it would seem to me, uh, you know, it, 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 it offers certain benefits um, in particular when it comes to the atomic settlement of, uh, of transactions, you know, we would be, we would be able to get away or, you know, uh, get rid of uh, quite a lot of the problems in terms of the counterparty risks that we're, we're seeing out there in the current financial system. So if tokenization can be, can be can be uh, done, that would potentially be a, quite a significant game changer. Now, however, it means also that this has to be done on, on very safe grounds. So, uh, you know, obviously you can't do that on, on a public uh, blockchain and so on, that in itself is, is quite unsafe. So, so there's a big role for central banks and public authorities to make sure that this this new technology can operate on the right rail, so uh, also something to look into. But this is really uh, still music for the future, so uh, it'll take uh, still some time. But but still, the foundations we we should be working on today. Well, thank you so much from my side. It's been truly rewarding, and I think that that's even a subject for another webinar to to move forward. But thank you, and over to you, Ernest. Thank you very much. This concludes our Swerve Buffy Bocconi high level policy panel on expanding clearing the US Treasury market, future proofing the world's safe asset. Thanks to Martin for initiating and introducing this interesting discussion. Really great appreciation. Thanks to Daryl, Iman, Klaus, and Andreas for your excellent presentations and uh, the intensive discussion, and to Aino for your informed and smooth moderation. Thank you so much. Bye-bye and take care. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.